Good morning, ladies. Shavua Tovu Mevorach. Today, the 26th day of Shevat, corresponding to the 5th of February 2024. Today's class is dedicated to Eilui Nishmat, Mr. Bobby Misri, right? Haim, <laughs> Haim Reuben Ben Faride, by his son, Mrs. Sekuki Savdiye, here present with us. Additionally, today's class dedicated for the Refua Shelema of Rachel Bat Haya, and as well the Refua Shelema of Hacham Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Hillel Ben Gladys Hatun. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu given Refua Shelema among the Holim of Am Israel, and a special dedication in honor of Mrs. Rivka Levy's birthday. Besiman Tov, by her husband, that's the message, Mr. Eli Levy. All right, I don't know, that's what your husband told me. You know, Hashem should bless you and him. Arichut yamim b'shanim tovot. For many more years of uh, happiness, health, and nahat from all your descendants. Amen. Happy birthday as well, Mrs. Levy. Happy birthday as well, Besimantov. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we are in Pirkei Avot, page 68. We finished last week the middle of this very deep and powerful uh, Mishnah that basically, just to summarize, uh, what the Mishnah started to discuss is that life has various stages from birth through growing up through becoming a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, and eventually, respectfully speaking, meeting the Creator. Relax. I hope nobody's planning any trip anywhere. Okay? Stick around. But Ezat Hashem Mashiach will be here in no time. And that's our hope. Amen. Amen. Mamash. Quickly, speedily in our days, the way we say, Amen. Amen. But... The Mishnah is giving us perhaps a bit of a understanding about life. Maybe I'll introduce this concept on the topic that we discuss uh, this past Shabbat afternoon in the class. It was not recorded, so I'm going to speak about it. We mentioned how uh, Cain and Hevel that unfortunate chapter of human history that in the beginning of the creation, Kyle's kills Hevel. So we started to discuss what prompted these actions from Cain. One of them was jealousy. That's the name of Cain. Cain comes from Lashon Kin'ah. Jealousy. He was jealous how the way he was born. He was jealous that he was born with a twin sister instead of two twin sisters. Sure. That was reason number one. Cain says, I'm the firstborn. I was born first. According to Torah law, the firstborn son gets double. I'm entitled to two. It sounds strange, but this is before the giving of the Torah. And we're talking about the first few days after they were created. Just for the record, just to add more spices to the topic, the Gemara writes that Cain and Hevel were not born through the normal process of pregnancy. It was instant delivery. Sure, pregnancy protocols of nine months of pregnancy was the outcome of the sin of Adam and Hava. The Gemara writes in Hebrew, Shenai ma'alu arba'a yardu. Two went up, four came down. Two went Adam and Hava, and then four came down, Cain and Hevel, and their sisters. Hevel says, you were born first because you were conceived last. I was conceived first because I came second. Sure. It's a lot of details. Okay, welcome to the Safra Synagogue Monday morning ladies class. What can I tell you? And I have some good news to tell you. Mashiach comes, no more pregnancy. Instant delivery. 
I cannot say that's too late. Wait till Mashiach comes, and then you'll know what the real protocols will be. Livelihood is also a consequence of the Avon of Adam and Hava. Back then, there was no need to work hard to put food on your table. You know, up to the time of Noah, one season was sufficient for 40 years. One season of work in the field, it had a 40-year blessing. We cannot relate to that. We cannot understand. But back then, the amount of blessing that the world had is beyond our comprehension. Hence, some people were above the normal of height, for example. But what really prompted Cain and Hevel a unfortunate, tragic end? One debate related to what we are learning in today's Mishnah. What is the purpose of life? And what happens after the person leaves the world? Does the action finishes or the action really starts after the person leaves the world? And I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but there is a lot of things that are written about the essence of the neshama. That's why somebody, God forbid, passes away. What do we have? Certain alachi cases, if it's a parent, a year of mourning. Different types of relatives, 30 days. We see Shiva, Kaddish, Le'ilui Nishmat. Like today's dedication, Le'ilui Nishmat, Mr. Bobby Misri, I remember him, Aleva Shalom. Chaim Reuben Ben Frida. What do you think that's happening today with his soul? I'm going to tell you what's happening. I'm not there, thank God. And I'm not planning to go anywhere, Baruch Hashem. Uh, but I know what's written in the holy books. That on the day of the Yorzeit, the Neshama, it's eager, literally, to receive deposits, direct deposits, into their account in Shamaim. Because the day of the Yorzeit, next to the day of Yom Kippur, for the exception of the first year of their passing, these are the two opportunities for the Neshama to be elevated closer and closer to Akadosh Baruch Hu. That's why we say, Le'ilui Nishmat. When you go to a Knis, and there is a Se'uda, make Ashkava, right? Make the memorial prayer. Or say Berachot to elevate the soul. Now, how can you eat and you elevate the soul? How can you eat? You are eating, I don't know, I don't, I don't see food here, but there was a magnificent breakfast earlier today. Thank you for the sponsorship. Nothing left, nothing, nothing, nothing. We usually have shiraim, you know, we have sometimes some goodies, but maybe maybe there is something in the fridge we tell them to bring. But why do we say you eat and you're lifting a soul? How can you do that? Very simple. Because we say in Berachot, in the memory of the Niftar. And like, like her today, she's sponsoring the Kshiaur in the Zahut of her father. So what happens? Before the Shi'ur, the Neshama was here, let's say. After the Shi'ur, that we have X amount of students coming and learning, now the Neshama gets more Zahut. Once this class is posted and distributed, the Zehut is even bigger. Maybe we should start chanting more. <laughs> Not bad. You get a lot of returns, more than the bank. Bank is paying you five point something, right? This is a thousand percent return for the Neshama. So why do we do this? Because we have basic beliefs. Number one, that life continues in a different dimension, not in the physical dimension, obviously. But based on what we learn today in the morning class, even in the physical dimension, the life of the Niftar remains alive. How? Through their descendants, through their children, 
to the grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and generations to come. That's a Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit. The Gemara brings an interesting dialogue between two great sages. And one of them says, Yaakov Avinu did not die. Yaakov Avinu lo met. Now I ask you, anybody in the audience, didn't we learn at the end of Perasha by He that Yaakov passed away and the Egyptians mourned him and his remains were brought over to Hebron, to Me'arat HaMachpelah? So how come the Gemara says Yaakov Avinu did not die? You know what the Gemara answers? Ma zar'o bahaim af hu bahaim. Like his descendants are alive, he is alive. Meaning the spirit of the person, the lessons, the examples that the person left behind in this world throughout their lifetime, it becomes like a guiding path for the future generations. And that's how we honor the memory of someone that is no longer among the living. Not only that. Cain and Hevel had this discuse, uh, discussion. Cain says, En din be'en dayan. In English it means, there is no judgment and there is no judge. Meaning, a person comes, a person goes through life, burial, and halas. This was kind. Not believing in the concept of sechar ba'onesh, reward and consequence of our actions, etc. Kain, that was Kain's perspective. Hevel says no. Yesh din be'yesh dayan. Every action causes a reaction. If I did not sleep last night, I'm going to be exhausted today. If I had a good night's sleep last night, I'm going to feel good today. The same thing with the good deeds. We do good deeds, it creates the way the Mishnah wrote in the early days of the Pirkei Avot, in the early chapters, that every misva creates, like, let's call them an advocate to intercede on our behalf, which is great to have. God forbid the opposite is the same. Every transgression we commit, suddenly we have a prosecuting force that becomes created by our misdeeds. In other words, we are creators. And I'm not talking about you created a formula or you created something of physical uh, aspect. I'm talking about from the aspect of spirituality because as Yehudim, we understand this perhaps better than the rest of the world. And by the way, the world also understands that there is such a thing as spiritual forces in the world. Right? Some of them do, some of them don't, but it's a completely different belief. And that's the reason why in our daily prayers, right in the beginning of the Amidah, we mention four or five times about resurrection. Baruch Atta Hashem Mechayem Etim. In two minutes, we say this, I believe. I believe in the resurrection. Now, I'm sure we have a lot of questions and I do not have a lot of answers, so save that topic on the side. But I'm going to share with you something of a deeper meaning. So after Cain and Hevel have this argument, we all know the tragic end. Cain kills Hevel. Everybody knows this. We're not going to go too much into that topic, but let's move forward. The moment that Cain kills Hevel, he creates a, a, a situation in the world never seen in human history, but also that carries a tremendous amount of responsibility about Cain. Why? Not only he killed his brother, but when he kills his brother, he also kills all the descendants of Hevel that never materialize 
as humans. I don't know how old Evel was. There are two opinions. One opinion says that they were six months old when this tragedy took place. But again, remember that back then, people, six months may have been 30, 40 years of today. The, according to what I remember, Cain and Hevel were conceived on the same day, they were born on the same day, and they were able to talk and to walk on the same day. All of the above in one day. Again, we don't understand it, we believe what's written in the holy books, but we understand that because we're dealing with a different dimension. Like in the time of Adam Arishon, how long did Adam Arishon live? 930 years. A person here reaches 67, 72, 75. I want to see my social security. Back then, and you get senior citizen discount, you know, the double ARP, whatever, AARP, right? I'm not there, but I know what's happening out there. But I have a couple of years still. Anyways, I hope the clock stops moving. I think we all hope the same, right? Anyways. I know, believe me, I understand. I'm human like you are. Anyways, so Hevel did not leave anybody behind him. So Hevel's mission in the world is incomplete. That's one situation. Cain being the reason why Hevel's mission is incomplete, now Cain has an exorbitant amount of reapers who he needs to achieve for the benefit of his soul. Let's fast forward the perasha of this past Shabbat. What was the perasha that we read? Itro. Remember one of the seven names that Rashi brings in perashat Itro? What was the name of Itro? Keni. From Cain. Yes. Reuel, Yeter, Hovab, Itro. Itro had seven names. And each name had a different purpose and mission. Itro was the name given to him after he became a Jew. He converted. Remember, Itro was the priest of Midian. He eventually becomes a Jew. And his change his name. His name is changed from Yeter to Itro. Rabbi Hari writes, and it's going to be a bit deep, but I think it's important to understand our Mishnah of today that the soul of Cain found a partial salvation in the life of Itro. Yes. In the Hebrew word, this is called tikkun or gilgul. Tikkun means a repair. Gilgul means reincarnation. The purpose of reincarnation of the soul, and please don't ask me questions because I do not have answers. Yesterday we learned in the tikkun of the Shovavim for men that a soul comes back to the world in different formats. Sometimes could be as a human, sometimes could be as an animal, sometimes could be as a bird, sometimes could be as a fish, sometimes could be as food, sometimes could be as a piece of wood, a tree and other matters, all levels of creation. So don't ask me questions on that topic because I'm not knowledgeable. I barely know my name. <laughs> no, because the name is your neshama. That's what's written by the Hida Kadosh. Hashem, he ha neshama. Your name is your neshama. In other words, in your name, it says what type of personality you have. Oh, I am. I need improvement, by the way. Okay, I can only talk about myself. Can't talk about anybody else. Let's continue. So who became one of the remedies for Cain? 
Itro. How do we know this? I'm going to share with you two small points to understand how the system worked. Remember what happened with Cain when I started to discuss the topic of jealousy? What was this jealousy of Cain? That Hevel had one extra sister. Cain had one sister. Hevel had two. When Moshe comes to the house of Itro, after all the small things that happen, what Itro does to Moshe? Gives them who Tzipora has his wife. You know what Rabbi Ari says? That Tzipora was the tikkun of one of the two sisters born with Hevel. Who was the other one? Batia. I said, you were here Shabbat. You're a good listener. Good. Batia and Zipporah, and all this information, it's written. Batia and Zipporah were the two sisters born with Hevel. Now, who is Hevel in this picture? Moshe Rabbeinu. Because the He of Moshe stands for Hevel. That's the He of Moshe. Very deep, I told you. It's a super deep Mishnah. I'm circumventing the deep words of the Mishnah by telling you the message of this Mishnah. Further. So we took care of the extra sister. Comes Itro, says to Moshe, a.k.a. Hevel, Mehila, that I killed you 2,448 years ago. Remember our argument of the extra sister? Please take Tzipora as your wife. So this is Tikkun number one for Itro. But this was not the ultimate problem. The ultimate problem was the philosophical argument Okay, some music is good. Music is good. No problem. No problem. Let's continue. What was this philosophical argument between Cain and Hevel? The concept of judgment. The concept of judges. If there is an action, consequence, reward, punishment, etc. What additional paragraph in this week's perasha, we find, besides the Ten Commandments, the topic of judges. What happens? Comes Itro and watches Moshe. Imagine my father-in-law comes, spends a day with me, and he says, Yosef, you need to delegate. You're going to burn out. Start delegating. Berveidim, this is what happened in this week's perasha. Itro says to Moshe, Moshe, you have thousands of people waiting to speak to you, to ask a question. Why don't you make your life easier by delegating minimal responsibilities? You know me long enough. People ask me all kinds of questions. From the simplest question, what time is Minha and Arvit? To uh, where do you find a, 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 a kosher restaurant with good supervision? Who do you call for, for, for medical? Today I tell you the phone calls that we received today. Tefillah, Kashrut, Mikve, medical, hospice, hospice. End of life decisions and family matters, to put it in a mild language. This is besides the classes and the minyanim and being in the office and doing a couple of things. Certain things I can delegate, but for some reason people say, no, we want you. So I said, I'm lucky that I'm not Moshe Rabbeinu. 
But what does Itro says to Moshe? Moshe, appoint judges every 50 people, every 100 people, every 1,000 people. Big questions. From all of these that I mentioned to you, there are three which are very challenging. Family feud. I'm not referring to the TV program, by the way. Okay? I'm Abdil. Okay? I'm human. I'm human. Don't forget that. And I was a child and a teenager and newly married a couple of years back. Hospice, end of life uh, decisions, and last will and testament. Those are the top challenging ones. After life is a different challenge. But Bekitsur, what happens with Moshe? Moshe listens to the advice of Itro, the Pasuk says. Moshe did as his father-in-law told him. You know what Abeno Ari says? That when Itro gave this advice to Moshe, it was Teshuvah for the argument that led Cain to kill Hevel. You understand? You follow? Meaning to say, the sin is the solution. In other words, if his shortcoming of Esav, of Cain was not to believe in the system of the judicial system, which, by the way, Goim, Gentiles, this is one of the seven Noahide laws that every country of the world must follow. Every citizen of the world, Goy I'm talking about, must follow seven universal Noahide laws. In Hebrew, it's called Shiva Mizvot Bene Noah. One of them is court system. Because if the world will not court system, the, the government, the law of the land, law and order, because if there is no law and order, people are not afraid of the law, people will not respect people's life. Meaning to say, many times people want to do certain things, but they, they think, hold on a minute, if I do this, I get caught, ta, ta, ta. So that fear of the law, and that's why the Mishnah, also in Pirkei Avot says, it says, pray for the welfare of the government. Because if people will not be afraid of the law of the land, people will kill each other. That's exactly what happened when they say defunct the police and all these things. These are anti-human laws. And this is not, God forbid, a political statement. It's necessary for the proper functioning. And this was the Teshuvah that Itro slash Cain did in Perashat Itro. Let me ask you a question. Why was there a need for Itro to come back 2,500 years later after this incident, or 2448, in order to remedy something lingering? You know why? Because invoices that are not being paid, spiritually speaking, talking about, they linger in the account of the person. And that's what the Mishnah says. Who are they? God is the creator. He is the judge. He is the witness. He is the plaintiff. And he doesn't forget, doesn't show favoritism, doesn't accept bribes. Everything is his. And everything is an accountability. And don't rest, don't assure, don't let the Yeserara to convince you that the grave will be your retirement lifestyle. You are conceived against your will. You are con born against your will. Meaning to say, when our parents conceived us, 
Did they ask us a question? No. When our mothers gave birth to any of us, did they ask us, what do you think? You think you like to be born on a, on, a, on a Monday or Tuesday? Maybe she followed the Gemara. I was born Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good day to be born, by the way. Different days of the birth, it determines part of the personality of the person. If you were born on a Monday, you are Monday morning quarterback. You know, you deal with a lot of things. Sunday is more relaxed. That's what it's read. Okay, you're getting ready to Shabbat, so that's good. Let's continue. met. God forbid, when it comes the ultimate stop in life, also, we don't get to pick. God forbid. And against your will, you are destined to give an accounting and a reckoning in front of the Almighty. Meaning to say, after the person leaves the world, and I'm not going to go into details, don't ask me, because it's deeper than what we think. There are transitions that the soul goes through. We know the name. We're not going to say that. Say it. Uh, we're not going to explain neither. Uh, not to frighten anyone. But let's call it a transition. That's a very mild word, and that's why the Zohar Kadosh writes, and it says that when God forbid somebody passes away, try to expedite the burial. Don't delay it. Try to do it as soon as you can because there is a certain peace of mind and tranquility to the neshama of the niftar. Obviously, if you take into Eres Israel, you have to take in consideration timing, etc. But other than that, the better. It all depends also what day of the week the person passed away. If a person passed away, let's say on a Friday, Thursday night, or the eve of a holiday, the eve of Yom Tov, the eve of Shabbat, and the person has the merit of being buried that day, then the Neshama skips a lot of the usual transitions because since in the heavens and in the physical world, the day is turning into a Shabbat or into a holiday, so they want to expedite the approval process. You know, okay, come on, come on, come on, go in, go in. If it's in the middle of the weekday, then there is a lot of transitional steps. But the Zohar Kadosh says that there is an additional reason why burials should not really be delayed. Why? Because sometimes a neshama has the merit that another neshama is coming down to the world to complete their mission. And they're waiting like in a game, a mavdil. You ever saw in a game... I'm not sure how it works, but I think that in most of the games is that the player, the substitute player, is by the sidelines, and then in a break, or they inform the referee, player number 12 is going out, player number 18 is going in. They cannot be in the field simultaneously because that means that that team will have an extra player. So once one player crosses the sideline, the new player goes in. The Zohar Kadosh writes and it says that is exactly what happens to certain neshamot. There is a tikkun willing to come down, but we're waiting for that soul to live. And what does it mean, the soul living? Short answer, burial. Not passing away. Because the neshama and the body, they had a great relationship for a certain amount of years. So the Neshama doesn't want to just take a one-way ticket to heaven, to paradise, whatever you want to call it. The Neshama wants to make sure that their, 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 their mate, the, the body, so to speak, their partner, is where he's supposed to go. So once that is done, then the Neshama is able to go. But how frightening everything that we mentioned today may appear to some, and God forbid, 
was not the audience, but I thought that this would be the easiest way to portray what this Mishnah talked about, all the different stages of life, that there is some uh, good news to share with the Kahal. And one of these good news is, we cannot stop the clock of life. The clock is ticking for everybody. But one thing that we for sure can do is to make sure that we have a nice savings account in Shamaim. Make direct deposit, Zelle, Venmo, Cash App, all these options that you have today. Do you use any of those? Okay, I do. Okay, many of us do. Whatever, doesn't matter. But we, we find ways of how to create a good account in Shamaim. And what I mean, I don't mean from the financial, I use simple words so we can relate, but the accounting of Torah, Mizvot, and Maasim Tovim. Make direct deposit. Every Amen, every Beracha, etc. And God willing, that will give us a cushion, so to speak, to counterbalance the occasional hiccups, spiritual hiccups that we may have had throughout our life, which obviously Teshuvah always help. Needless to say, but I like to say one more thing, and I had it right here. It came to my lips, but now is in stuck in traffic. Stuck in traffic. I had it. I had it, and I said this will be the best closing statement. I know Mashiach has been coming for the past 2,000 years and we don't give up hope. What was I about to say? Hold on, I, I cannot. I cannot allow myself not to say it. Yeah, you want me to go to reverse psychology? Go back and reverse. Okay, I spoke about the investments in our spiritual life. I spoke about doing Teshuvah for the past. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. You see, it helped. Okay, you can put it in your life coach sessions. Okay? Anyways, so what was I about to say? That Akadosh Baruch Hu gives us a gift. First of all, the gift that I'm talking about is called the gift of life. And that was something that we learned yesterday. That a person should pray that their life should continue healthy till the, the day of decision. Sometimes, God forbid, people go through a lot prior to that and they, they those consciousness and understanding and all kinds of matters that affects life. So he says a person should pray that the brain should be lucid, literally, till whatever God decides. But I'll tell you what's written in the Perasha Shofetim. Perasha Shofetim, it says the importance of appointing among the Jewish people judges and officers. Judges to uh, give the ruling of the law and officers to activate the law, from, to enforce the law. Thank you. From a spiritual perspective, this refers to the brain and to the heart. The brain, the intellect of life, the heart is the emotions of the heart. Make sure that every city has this kind of system. In a deeper level, I'll give you two, two explanations. It says that the human body on their face, we all have this, has openings. Ears, eyes, nose, and mouth. So it says the Torah, in all these openings, you can do a mitzvah or you can do a sin. If I stay quiet, I'm doing a mitzvah. If I speak and I hurt someone, I'm doing an avon. If I say a beracha, I do a mitzvah. If I yell at someone, I curse someone, I do an avon. If I don't listen to nonsense or lashonara, 
I'm blocking my ears. But if I do, I'm hurting them. So that's the basic meaning of this pasuk. But it says the Hatam Sofer that when it comes to the last sentence of this Mishnah, that the person will be in front of the Almighty to give a reckoning and an accounting of their actions. It says that actually there is a benefit in this concept. What is the benefit? Let's say that a person needs to do hatarat nedarim. A person wants to nullify a promise. How many judges do you need? Three. Okay? Hazak. A person had a bad dream and wants to make the special prayer of bad dreams. How many people do you need? Three. You want to sign a bedin document, you need three people. So the Mishnah says, God. So how do we satisfy the Allahic requirement of having three? If the Mishnah mentioned one, says the Hatam Sofer, that God selects two judges who lived on the same time that the person in front of him. And this is a gift. Why? Imagine yourself that God forbid a person in the year 23, 2024 meets the Creator. And they suddenly, they're going to bring, let's bring two rabbis from the Mishnah. Rabbeinu Obadi of Bartenura, who lived several hundred years ago, and Rabbi Tarfon. Can you relate to either one of them? No. Can they relate to us? No. Why not? Because they lived in different times. So out of the Hesed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does with us, you know what does he do? He takes two Hachamim who left the world during our generation and they will mitigate the judgment. Because the question may come, how did you do such a thing? And one of the rabbis will say, Oh, you don't understand Amazon, Venmo, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, 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 give me another one. Facebook. I'm bringing something that 20 years ago, for me, TikTok was the sound of the clock. Instagram. Can you relate to the extremes? That is a chesed that Akadosh Baruch Hu does with the Neshama. Because if our parameter of judgment will be utilized by hachamim which were not in tune with the challenges of our generation every generation we need to know this and will this i'll finish every generation has its own package in yiddish they say pekale you know what a pekale means you have your package havila when you go to the airport you don't pick the most elegant Louis Vuitton uh, um, uh, 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 bag. You take your bag because you know what's inside of it. Same thing in Shemaim. The judgment is done based on the parameters of the generation. That's part of the story. But there is a second truth that I didn't say. No measuring tools are the same. Every person, the way the Mishnah writes, I'm going to say this in a positive note. There is a statement that says, Lefum sa'ara agra. According to the effort, Hashem rewards the person. Let's say that some of you drove half an hour to come to the class. And someone drove two minutes to come to the class. Or someone rearranged their schedule to come to the class. We all came to the same class. We all sitting in the same room. We all learning the same Torah. We all following the same book. But between our home and coming to the Shi'ur, Hashem has a different parameter of reward. 
to the person. Maybe somebody that has difficulty walking. A few weeks ago, we met someone in the shul. No, more than a few weeks. Maybe a few months ago. We met someone in the shul that takes the person to come to the synagogue for hours. Four hours to prepare themselves to come to the synagogue due to medical reasons. Can you imagine four hours to get ready to come to shul? To most of us, I think one hour, it's plenty. Taking a shower, bathroom, getting dressed, whatever. Okay? Four hours. He cannot get dressed by themselves. He cannot walk. God forbid, can you imagine that effort that a person needs to do? That's what the Mishnah writes. Le fum sa'ara agra. According to the effort invested, Hashem compensates the person. And that's also to our benefit. And by that Hashem, uh, we maximize our potential in life. We do the most that we can. We do make deposits as i said before as much as we can it's never you don't get over over those in misvot and maasim tovim you only get beracha and you only get a great benefits for our life not only in this world but also in the world uh, to come tiskola misvot to all of the general sponsors of today's class shavua tov umevorach to everybody we'll see tomorrow for the spanish class okay 11 o'clock